the late uh, Dr. Samaya was known to me. We met many times, had wonderful conversations, and he inspired me a lot. I admired him a lot. And many times he said, you must come and visit our institute and spend some time there and give some talks. I never got to do it while he was alive, but I'm absolutely delighted to be here in his institution. And I'm thinking of him while giving this talk and his great, uh, his greatness in the kind of work that I'm doing. Uh, he was also very interested in doing similar work. You know, when I address the youth of India, which I've been doing quite a lot, I find that they want to understand where their tradition and culture and history and philosophy and all that fits into their quest for a career. They want to have a successful career, which is very important. Everyone should have that. They want to do well in a material sense, make money, have a family, all those things, buy a car and house and all that. And they sometimes have been given the wrong impression that our tradition uh, is sort of something which, a lot, which causes you to not do well in these things. And, and this is not, in fact, the case. Uh, our tradition, unlike in Europe, where they had a big fight between science and religion, we've never had a fight in our tradition with science, technology, because the inner world, the inner journey, and the outer world the outer, uh, you know, progress have gone hand in hand all the time. There's never been a time when somebody comes up with something new about astronomy or mathematics or chemistry and or biology and some, you know, religious authority tells him that you're not allowed to think this way. We've been a tradition of challenge. People are allowed to challenge, question. In fact, many of our great texts are dialogue where somebody's questioning the other. Usually the person who's studying is challenging the master. And uh, this is part of our tradition, to question and challenge and to keep improving our knowledge because our tradition says that we are evolving. Human beings are not as we currently exist. This is not the final state of our consciousness. We are evolving. There are higher states of consciousness that yogis achieve, rishis achieve, and so there's more to know than we can know at this level. So progress in knowledge, progress in science and technology is normal and to be encouraged. Also as far as material welfare is concerned, we have the Purusharth or the legitimate quest of Arth, which is prosperity, material wealth, Kaam, which is desire, dharma, which is ethics and your, the way you tr treat other people, from family to society to Mother Earth to your own body, and finally moksha, which is transcendence of all these. So nowhere does it say that every person should sort of give up all these things and just go into an otherworldly domain. That is a misconception and a misrepresentation which happened in relatively recent times. I haven't uh, gone to the bottom of this, but I have a theory for our historian friend, the uh, professor who introduced me, to consider that maybe when people are colonized by somebody, uh, it's in the colonizer's interest to convince the colonized people that they should be otherworldly and not be politically active and not be interested in material prosperity because then, you know, they have less ambition. They can become servants and slaves and, and, and not, be, uh, not be difficult to manage and control. So maybe this otherworldly interpretation of our tradition is a more recent thing in colonial times. Because if you go back, you go back to the Indus Saraswati civilization, Harappa, Dholavira, Mahinjodaro, 2,000 sites, you find very advanced cities, tiles, weights and measures. You find high, uh, highly sophisticated architecture, technology, science. In fact, my foundation is doing you know, many, many volumes. We produced nine volumes already 
on the history of Indian science and technology, just to make the point that Indian traditions are not antithetical or opposed to science and technology. In fact, we have a great history of that. So if you continue the journey forward from that era, you find great advancements in medicine, you find great advancements in uh, biology, in agriculture, shipping. Long before the current global era, current global era is not the first globalization. There used to be an Indian Ocean globalization. Europe was not part of that economy, but from Africa, Middle East, India, Southeast Asia, China, there used to be a thriving economy with a land route, which is called the Silk Route, and a sea trade based around India. And uh, the old shipwrecks and old uh, artifacts found in these different places I named are plenty of testimony, and the stories about this trade are, exist in all parts of these countries. So Africa, Asia, all over were integrated into global trade. Europe was an outsider, and Europe got its goods from India and China, which were highly prized. There's a American uh, historian who wrote a paper, uh, I've forgotten his name, I think uh, that might not be the correct name, but the title of the paper is called Southernization. Southernization. This came about in the 1990s. And in that paper he writes that right just now, like, like nowadays, the fashion is westernization. Everybody wants to westernize because the goods coming from the West are considered very nice. There was an era which he called southernization where the fashion in Europe was to buy goods from South Asia, goods from India. So many kinds of goods, textiles, steel, medicines, these were sought after from the, our, our part of the world. In fact, uh, a certain kind of steel which is known as Woods steel, W-O-O-T-Z, steel was only made in India. It was the toughest steel in the world. And the Romans and Greek in ancient times used to pay a lot of money to buy this steel because if you made swords from this steel, it would not break. And if you made a shield, it would not be penetrated. So in war, uh, the winners were people who could buy these kind of, uh, the, these kind of we the weapons made from this kind of steel and pierce through the other person. So there was medicines. Uh, the, a, a, an American scholar who is in uh, Dartmouth, University of Massachusetts, Dartmouth, or Dartmouth, where I'm associated, he's a scholar of Portugal, Portuguese history. And he went to Goa and looked at some of the archives stored in government centers, you know, old archives of trade, which the Portuguese were doing, to find out what, what made the Portuguese come here, why were they so interested, what was this trade all about. Now, we are told that they came for spices. But you don't think that something as simple as spice would be such a big deal. Why would someone come and make a big empire for something as simple as spice? And what is shown is that actually it was medicines. One of the, there's textiles, medicines, steel. And plant medicines were, classified, were later translated as spices. But they were plant medicines. And Portugal was importing these plant medicines from India and became the supplier for all over Europe. The volume of medicines was 10 times more than the Portuguese population needed. So they became thriving in trade, making tons of money doing this. So India was a very prosperous place. Until 1750, the Cambridge History of Economics says that India had 24 or 25% of world GDP. World GDP, yeah? And in 100 years after that, India was below 5%. So that is called the Industrial Revolution of England. So you can see a correlation between the industrialization of England and the deindustrialization of India. And in the, if you read the Industrial Revolution, the historians write about how the Industrial Revolution was fueled by two things first, textiles and steel. Both of those are Indian products, both of those. Uh, in fact, what may not be well known is that uh, the London Bridge, when they were constructing the London Bridge, the East India Company wanted to procure the best steel in the world. So some, a large part of that steel they got from India because they concluded that this is the finest steel at the cheapest price, strongest steel. So some of the London Bridge is made of Indian steel. 
So this uh, uh, huge export economy, materially thriving, is not uh, something new that we are developing. That's why I don't like the term development of India. I, I prefer calling it redevelopment of India because it was already a developed place. It got undeveloped and now it is redeveloping. So this kind of a renaissance of India, of which you youngsters are a part, has to balance the material, physical, scientific, technological plane with the traditions. Uh, traditions. You see, the traditions are like the inner infrastructure. We all know that the when we say India needs infrastructure, they generally think outer infrastructure, roads and ports and airports and railways and all that. It's fantastic. We need all that. And we have a history of, in traditional times, having that. But the inner infrastructure is character, is your quest, your purpose, your meaning in life. These are important things. And they are not mutually exclusive. They go hand in hand together. So this is the first thing I wanted to um, bring up. Second thing is that the message in this book is a pan-Indian message. It applies to all Indians. It is, no, it is not an exclusivist. It doesn't apply to certain people. Because when I talk about classical Indian dharmic traditions, the, they are very open, very like an open architecture. One can assimilate a whole lot of uh, new things, new ideas. My own story, I, I, I'm not a traditional scholar. I had a very modern upbringing. Uh, went to a Catholic school in Delhi. I went to St. Stephen's College, which is a Christian college, very secular education. I studied physics, then I went overseas, then studied computer science. Then I worked in the corporate world and was, it had a material progress in terms of making money and accumulating wealth and building a, you know, a, a nice lifestyle for my family. And at the same time, my spiritual quest. So it is not that you have to stop being one in order to be the other. I think you can do both. You can be balanced uh, and, and be all-encompassing. I, I incorporate all these things and do not feel that there is any contradiction in, in this sort of uh, value system, which I think is very important for you to understand. So when you take some messages from this book, which explains the importance and the distinctiveness of Indian civilization, it is not with chauvinism or it is not with some kind of an agenda that excludes anybody, because that would be very un-Indian, in my opinion. So the uh, purpose of this book was to discover for myself what constitutes the core of Indian civilization, which makes it distinct from Western civilization. I wanted to understand that. I lived in the West for 40 years, more than 40 years now, have been visiting India several times a year, remain completely Indian in my heart and in my identity, and yet very functional and very, uh, you know, Americanized at the same time and very loyal to the US and all that. So I never found a contradiction in these. And the, But I realized that the study of civilizations has been done mainly by the West because of the colonial history. So the Westerners sent scholars everywhere, studied them, and mapped them, mapped those cultures onto Western terms. So uh, the Indologists mapped what they learned about India to fit Western categories. And a lot of the things about India don't fit Western categories properly, but they are forced to fit. So this has created a lot of distortion. And the making India fit the Western categories is a system of control. Because once you've understood somebody in your own terms, then you can control them. If you don't even understand them, if they're too chaotic or they're too unpredictable or there's just too much complexity and you are overwhelmed by all this huge complexity, you really don't know how to act and to control them. So the study of India in Western terms was part and parcel of empire building and part and parcel of control. So now, this served the purpose of the colonizers and, it's, and it helped the West uh, 
claim that it has universal knowledge because it has mapped all the civilizations onto Western terms. And so the West's history became seen as universal history. The West's philosophy and ideas became considered universal. That is what I mean by Western universalism. The, the, the notion that what the West has said and done and discovered and how it feels is sort of the gold standard. Everybody has to be measured against that. And, and this Western universalism was then exported to places like India, taught in our schools and colleges, replacing the traditional systems. And uh, this was an agenda also to educate Indians over the last hundred years to think more like the Westerners and to look up to the Westerners as superior, look at their own tradition as inferior. So this is, this is how colonization works. And though we got decolonized politically, we did not get decolonized mentally. Still, the mental colonization is there. There's a lot of uh, inferiority complex in our own tradition. Uh, sometimes something about our tradition has to become Americanized. And then when it comes back, because an American has put his stamp on it, then we think, wow, it must be good. you know. So this is called the pizza effect. Uh, pizza effect means, you know, pizza in Italy was not a sophisticated person's diet. It was something that peasants used to eat. Like in Punjab, where I'm originally from, you know, you eat maki roti and saag, you know. A peasant eats that. And some real big shot does he serves, you know, different cuisine. This is a peasant cuisine. So pizza was a peasant's cuisine in Italy until Pizza Hut Americanized it and made it into a worldwide thing and put tens of thousands of pizza huts all over the world. And so the Italians had a sense of pride that, you know, our pizza has gone everywhere. So now the Pizza Hut comes back to Italy also, Americanized. And so it is consumed with pride. So pride in culture, because the other superior or dominant or more powerful cultures have adopted it and given it back to you. This is called the pizza effect. Now, there are many pizza effects I've studied concerning India. One of them is, I'll give you an example. IIT Kharagpur, I just was, I was there about three days ago giving a talk. Uh, more than a decade ago, they were celebrating their 50th anniversary. So they applied to my foundation for a grant to uh, sponsor some conferences to celebrate their 50th anniversary. And one of the conferences they were going to have was Mind Conference on Mind Science. So I got very excited because I'm very interested in mind science. Our, all our yoga and all our lot of our shastras are about the nature of mind, the nature of self. You know, that's what nowadays they call psychology and mind science, but we've had that for a very long time. In fact, our dharma is more about the science of mind than what you call religion. It's less to do with the, the conventional term religion is very different idea than the nature of uh, understanding the self and self-actualizing and so on. So it's more like psychology, if you will. So when I got that grant request, I was very keen to find out what exactly are they planning to do. I asked them for a, you know, details, detail plan, detail schedule, and they sent me uh, details of what the panels will be, who will be speaking, speaking on what. And there was not a single panel or a single speaker talking about Indian ideas of psychology or Indian ideas of mind. Every panel and every panelist, both Westerners and Indians, were talking about only Western thought. So this bothered me. So I wrote to them saying, I'm interested in sponsoring, but I'm only interested in sponsoring if you have at least one panel on Indian thought, on Indian thought of mind, what is the nature of mind. And I got back this email saying, Sir, we're very scientific people, we're not chauvinists, we're not right-wing people like that. So they couldn't get it. They were so alienated from their own side, their own self. So what I did is, to create the pizza effect, I approached a few white scholars. 
uh, one or two British, one, uh, some Americans, uh, who I know are very deeply involved in the practice of yoga. One of them is, is practiced Kundalini for 20, 30 years. He's a professor in California. One of them is a Buddhist scholar and, uh, you know, initiated by the Dalai Lama and he's a great, uh, well-known person. One had translated Patanjali Yoga Sutra and practiced it for a long time and so on. Uh, one was a Sri Aurobindo scholar and he was in neuroscience. So I called them up and I said, you know, uh, I'm always telling you that you guys need to do more for, uh, you know, Indian civilization. You are capturing so much knowledge, but you're not paying back anything. And you've always said, uh, tell us something to do and we'll, we'll be doing it. So here is something you can do. What I want you to do is go to this conference in India and each of you give a talk on your whole journey, how you got into this Indian thought and Indian mind science, who initiated you, because many of them had lived in Rishikesh and they had a guru and they had been initiated, you know, then they had gone to the West and started becoming a professor. So I want you to tell your whole journey truthfully. Don't hide anything. Don't try to uh, show how it is all Western. Show the Indian origins exactly like you know. And use the Sanskrit words. Don't don't uh, try to hide them with some Western translations. And then explain what you, how it is part of your life and what, why you're teaching this in uh, prestigious colleges like Cambridge, one guy was teaching, in one, another one was teaching in Columbia University. So uh, tell, tell them about how it's part of the curriculum and what is the value of this to modern society, how are your students benefiting, how it's uh, improving them in their, in their own psychology, in their own ability to manage, manage life better. So give them the whole story without holding anything back. And they agreed. They agreed that they would do this. So I took their biodatas and their abstracts of what they were going to present and I sent it to IIT Kharagpur saying this is the panel I think you should do on Indian mind science and they immediately accepted it. Because now it was Westerners, not uh, some Desi guy like me. So this is the pizza effect, complex, inferiority complex. So uh, when the event happened, it was, uh, there was a US uh, uh, warning against travel to India because there was a conflict in Kargil and all that. So, but when the event happened, one or two of these Westerners dropped out. They were afraid, but many of them came. And they got standing ovations. They got standing ovations in IIT Kharagpur, considered one of the best panels. And there were so many psychologists, professors in the, audi in the audience. So these guys told me that it was a big success and uh, we've been invited to various conferences, a conference on psychology in Kerala, one in Chennai, one in Pondicherry, then in Delhi and so on. So my foundation said, okay, let's encourage this. So you guys keep going. So they became my team to go around various places in India giving talks on Indian psychology. And then I used them to find Indians who were interested in joining. And then I started uh, funding Indians. A lot of Indians we funded who we discovered as a result of this. Uh, so for example, in, uh, there's one Sangeeta Menon in uh, National Institute of Advanced Studies. We sponsored about seven, eight, nine trips of hers, conferences of hers, writings, papers, books by her, and a few other people like that we started sponsoring. Uh, to get Indians into the act, inspired and encouraged by Westerners. And so this created a mobilization, and after 10 years of funding this, we sort of moved on because we can only fund so much. We can start, you know, we can open doors. Our specialty is open a new door, let others take over and we move on to something else. So I haven't uh, sponsored anything in that area for many, many years. But I was invited in Delhi to talk about this book in the psychology department by some of the same people who've been involved in this now. It's a movement with about 200 scholars in Indian universities in psychology departments who are teaching what they are calling Indian psychology. Indian psychology is no longer something you laugh at and you know, no longer something somebody will say, well, this is unscientific and chauvinistic. It's, it's taken as a serious discipline. And after listening to me address this book, 
they decided that this book of mine being different will be prescribed as a textbook in MA course in psychology in Delhi University. So that's a very big thing. And then they had a, another conf uh, a gathering of their 150, 200 psychology professors all over India. Uh, later they said, when you're back, we'll have that gathering and you give them a, a half day will be for you, you give them a nice long seminar, which I did. So maybe this will spread to other universities and perhaps this institute might also want to consider using this uh, in, in that sense. So uh, using the pizza effect to pierce through Indian complexes, we're able to create a movement and that movement takes a life of its own. So this is, this is how our culture is sometimes uh, helping people in other countries and we are not valuing it enough and then when they put their stamp and they get their patents and they get their trademarks and they become very famous, uh, they send it back here and we say, wow, this is fantastic. There is a famous uh, Harvard guy called uh, Harold Gardner and he's developed a theory called multiple intelligences, which means that rather than thinking of a person having one intelligence, he's got many intelligences, many kinds of intelligence, emotional intelligence, rational mind, many, various kinds of uh, qualities. They are different intelligences. And he's become very famous for the last 30, 40 years or 30 years or so for this, uh, what is considered to be a very original idea. And I was, uh, every year he comes to India, the Tatas invite him. A few weeks ago, Infosys had a whole seminar. They all big, you know, all the big shots were there, uh, you know, thanking this guy for introducing such a brilliant new thing in India. But actually, when you go back to his early life and what has influenced him, you find that Sri Aurobindo had written something called Planes and Parts of Being, which means that the human being is not sort of one, it is many planes, many planes of, uh, of uh, existence and many parts and each of them needs to be educated. You need to be whole. You cannot ignore any part of you. From, you know, being a physical person to an emotional person, aesthetic person, intellectual person, all kinds of intelligences exist. So that was an influence on him. And also the Natashastra talks about different rasas, different qualities of appreciation, different ways of uh, being, you know, in your mind. Uh, so when a Harvard guy takes all this, comes up with a fancy jargon, he becomes world famous, and Indians think, wow, this is the guy we need. But I'm sure if you were to go to Infosys and Tata's and say, we're going to teach you how to, uh, the benefits of Nati Shastra for your corporate education, or we're going to teach you Sri Aurobindo's philosophy, they'll say, Arey, you're some chauvinist guy, and you must be some nationalist guy. So this is the, this idea I'm calling the U-turn theory. U-turn meaning that something is taken from here, it's taken to the West, they remove the Indian sources, they westernize it, and they re-export it back, and we welcome it and say, wow, what a thing, you know. Uh, this is happening in medicines also. Some, most of the molecules that the pharmaceuticals isolate, and then they do a lot of research on one molecule which will fix something and turn into a white pill, most of these are plant extracts, animal extracts. And uh, most of, they don't just randomly pick a molecule. A typical plant will have so many thousands of molecules, you can't just figure out which one will work. But they, uh, you don't know which plant will do what. So they look at traditional systems of medicine and they see what is being tried in various places, how it's working, and then they try to figure out what molecule out of that plant is the, is the active ingredient. So a lot of R&D in modern pharmaceuticals is being done like that. A lot of R&D in neuroscience and cognitive science is being done on Indian yogis and Buddhist meditators to, who, who are asked to achieve high states of consciousness through meditation and then they have something called functional MRI to scan the brain and see how it's being altered. And this is leading to the, this is the cutting edge. If you are a student of neuroscience or cognitive science, you'll be reading a lot of Western theories. You will have no idea of their link with Indian thought and Indian traditions. 
And I'm writing a book to actually expose that and connect that because I want our next generation to know that these, these great Western thinkers who are considered pioneers in cognitive science and neuroscience were at the feet of some Indian spiritual master in the early, early youth. And uh, for instance, there is a Dr. Herb Benson in Harvard who has become very famous for developing a trademarking and patenting a concept called the relaxation response. And he, the Templeton Foundation is really championing him. He's on their board of directors and in their move to have a bridge between science and religion, which they are doing it with a mostly a Christian kind of uh, orientation. He's one of the champions of bringing science and religion together. <laughs> but you look at his early books and his early research, he was studying transcendental meditation of Maharishi Mahesh Yogi, and he was very impressed by what medical benefits came out of that, so he started researching. But rather than saying I'm researching transcendental meditators, because that would give it away, uh, he also wanted to kind of uh, uh, claim it as his own original thing. So he said that they are practicing the relaxation response technique. He, he coined that phrase and became quite famous for that. Then there is uh, Stephen Laberge in Stanford who uh, took yoga nidra. Yoga nidra is a certain practice in yoga in, where you achieve a state of uh, a consciousness where the body is sleeping but you are alert. It's very interesting. I went and got a teacher's training certificate in that just to learn something about, about it for myself. And you know it's very interesting that uh, the person who goes into this yoga nidra state, you are fully alert, mind is not active in anything but you are fully alert. Others will tell you that you are snoring, that you are deep sleep. So your body is in deep sleep and you are sort of awake, kind of very interesting thing. And this has many properties, many healing properties, it does various things. So he called, he renamed it Lucid Dreaming. And he started these institutes all over the world called Lucid Dreaming. Dreaming. So I went to one of these Lucid Dreaming conferences and I was very impressed by a very large crowd of uh, scientists and spiritualists teaching this Lucid Dreaming. And he was giving all this talk. So I said to him later, privately over dinner, I said, you know, this reminds me of Yoga Nidra. So he was very happy to talk to me offline and said, yeah, yeah, I learned it with such and such guru, spent 20 years, studied it there. He was telling me, he said, I love India, I eat all this Indian food, I eat with my hands. And he was becoming very Indian, you know, with me. So I said, why don't you say it in front of all those people? Why are you telling me privately? Why don't you say it publicly? And in your papers, why don't you acknowledge it? So he says, I'm doing you a favor because if I were to call it Indian, I would never get grants, it will never propagate so much. People will think it's some old, you know, religion. But to make it scientific, I have to hide all that. Plus, actually, you should be grateful. I'm taking your ideas and making them further, propagating them. I say, well, actually, you're doing yourself a favor because you're becoming famous and you're separating us from the, you're separating this technique from the source. And the source has many more advanced things to offer besides just what you've learned. You've learned one part of it, but there's many more things. So this way I could go on. There is one um, John Kabat-Zinn, who teaches Vipassana, who learned Vipassana from Goenka, did a lot of medical research and was able to show that many diseases can be cured. Then he stopped uh, using the term Vipassana and, and trademarked mindfulness meditation. And this is taught in all kinds of hospitals and so on. And the interesting thing is that in the US, my Indian friends who are doctors, some of them have attended his courses, they come back and say, oh, I'm now, I'm now introducing this new technique from Massachusetts into my practice. So I tell him what is this technique and they tell me what the technique is, I tell him this is Vipassana. And they, are, they refuse to believe it. So the uh, Indian sources which have U-turned from the West are huge. And I am writing six volumes. This book is just the, to set the stage. But I'm writing six volumes on different kind of U-turns in medicine, neuroscience, in art, literature, linguistics. Modern linguistics in Europe was born out of the study of Panini grammar. Panini grammar was studied in the 1800s very vigorously. In fact, from the year 1800 to the year 1850, most major universities across Europe 
created a huge department of Sanskrit and Indian classics. Indology, they gave it the name Indology. And this was to learn, mine, appropriate, get new ideas. And after they got all these ideas, they started downsizing these departments because they felt they had gotten what was worth getting. And they had reclassified, repackaged these into Western idiom and Western terms and claimed to be the pioneers and original thinkers. So many, many modern disciplines were born or are influenced by this. And one of them is modern linguistics. So the, uh, the, the, you, you might have come across postmodernism as a topic. Some of you might be, if you're studying English, you study postmodernism. Postmodernism or poststructuralism is born out of structuralism. First came structuralism, and then it was extended and superseded by poststructuralism. But structuralism is attributed to a man called Ferdinand Saussure in France. Ferdinand Saussure in France in the late 1800s and early 1900s uh, is considered the father of structuralism. But what they don't tell you is that he was a Sanskrit professor. His PhD in France was on Panini's grammar, conjugate verbs in Panini. That was the topic of his PhD. So he's grounded in that. He's teaching Paninian ideas of meaning and sign and signifier and philosophy and all that. When he dies, his students posthumously publish his class notes, minus all the references to Sanskrit, and that becomes that book becomes known as the origin of structuralism. So there's a lot of our culture which is part of the modern West. And I'm giving you these examples to sort of inspire you that you, if you want to compete against the modern West in a very uh, practical, worldly sense, you should have a sense of identity. You should also have a sense of who you are, what your heritage brings, uh, what the West has gained from your heritage. Because you may think that identities are going out of style, but they're not. Uh, when you grow old and work in a multinational with people from all the cultures and you become a big boss and you are going around cutting deals in foreign countries. Uh, you know, when you're sitting with a Frenchman, he's very clearly French. He doesn't want to be mixed with an Italian or an Englishman or a, Ger a German or a Russian. He's very proud, he's very clearly French. When you meet a Russian, he's very sure of what it means to be a Russian, the greatness of Russia. When you meet a Chinese, he's got no, no doubts about his Chinese. He understands Chinese thought, he understands, he can talk, he's like an ambassador of Chinese culture. When you meet a Japanese, while he may be very scientifically advanced, technologically advanced, but he's still very Japanese in his sense of identity and culture, and so on. I could give you many of these examples. Koreans are very Korean. They don't want to be mixed up as Chinese or as Japanese. They find it very insulting if you tell a Korean that you're the same as Japanese or Chinese. They don't like it. So this sense of civilizational identity is pervasive throughout the, uh, th throughout the world today. Uh, but it's unfortunate that when I find Indians coming to the West, they really are shy of their identity. They don't know what to say. I have had all kinds of silly answers. The, Who are you? What is it? Tell me about India. What does it stand for? I mean, they really lack a sense of history, positive history. They've been taught negative history of what's wrong with our historicity, what is wrong with us, why we should be embarrassed of who we are, and we should give it up as quickly as we can. They are very, they like to avoid the topic of historical identity in a conversation. And it's very obvious that the guys are awkward. He'd rather talk about how much he's got this BMW or he's making this GDP growth rate and all that kind of stuff, which is good, but he, he lacks a sense of selfhood which is anchored and rooted the way the other countries have. And this is also found in Indian diplomats. I found that Indian diplomats, you would think that at least the Ministry of External Affairs would really give a good indoctrination of what it means to be Indian in a classical sense. But I find that these guys are avoiding these issues. And then there has been a very ill-conceived uh, notion of what it means to be secular. It's a very strange peculiar idea. In the United States, and, and since secular is a Western concept, 
in the United States, secularism doesn't mean you, got, you should be cut off from your classics. Every university is very proud of a great classics department. They teach their classical thought, Roman thought, Greek thought, you know, uh, thought of various uh, classical periods. They teach that. Our classics would be the Vedas and the Upanishads and the, you know, our Itihas and all that. There would be our classics, the Dharma Shastras, the Arth Shastras, the Nat Shastras, these kind of things. But our, we haven't uh, gotten that kind of a grounding. Whereas uh, you go to Harvard University Classics Department, Princeton University Classics Department, that's sort of the foundation of good learning. And anyone, whether it is uh, Obama or Bush or Clinton or Carter, they would be well grounded in who are the founding fathers and what is the classics of the Western civilization, they would be very well grounded. You go to University of Chicago, they have five courses that are required, mandatory for no matter what you are studying. What you are studying doesn't matter. You got to take these five courses. One of them is on Western civilization. Western civilization, not world civilization, Western civilization. So they can keep talking about, okay, there is no more boundaries, there is no more identities, but they're not practicing it. You look at the giant monuments of the greatness of this president or that war, this war memorial, you know, the big parades in New York of various kinds of identities. Identities are everywhere, and the grand, great grand narratives of history are everywhere. But somehow Indians have been told to be ashamed of that in the name of secularism, which is a very ridiculous uh, idea of secularism, because secularism is not meant to be a negation of uh, our identity uh, in terms of our classical past, especially since that classical past tolerated and respected, very much respected, all kinds of new cultures coming in and gave them a good habitat, gave them a homeland encourage them. So there's no reason to be ashamed of that. I'll conclude with a story to uh, illustrate this point of, uh, uh, you know, alienation from our culture in the name of secularism. In 2005, there was a world conference on Sanskrit in Thailand, organized by the Crown Princess of Thailand. And a year or two before, they were preparing for this because the crown princess of Thailand is a Sanskrit scholar. You might not know this. But she sent her two sons to Tirupati University and places in India to learn Sanskrit also because their heritage, they feel, is uh, Sanskriti. What we call Sanskriti or culture is their heritage. So she was inaugurating a Sanskrit college and a Sanskrit journal. And so they were holding this world conference. And they wanted Indian participation, because after all, India is the mother civilization. Like Westerners would think Greece is their mother civilization. And they could not get India interested. Ironically, a BJP government were not interested in helping them. Okay? So there was a professor in Delhi University who was on the organizing committee. And he got, uh, he tried a lot, lobbied a lot in Delhi, couldn't get much help because people kept saying, we are secular, we don't do these things. Very strange. So finally he called me and said, you know, it will be a very embarrassing thing if no Indian support comes. Why don't you give some help and we'll call it uh, Indian participation. So I said, I'm NRI, I live in US, I have a very tiny foundation. I, I can't speak as India, you know. He said, Nene, even symbolically we'll say this is an Indian. And so just to uh, save the situation, we agreed to give some grant and I became a uh, you know, co-sponsor of uh, along with the crown princess of this event. So uh, the event was all organized and I was on the dais with the crown princess. We inaugurated the whole thing and various events were held for three days. They really wanted to understand Sanskrit and in br bring it into their traditional system. But then a uh, couple months before, a month or two before, the HRD minister calls and says, I'd like to be part of it too, because now it's a success. All the hard work is done. Now it's a PR opportunity to be seen with the crown princess and with the famous people and international press is going to be there, Western scholars are going to be there, so he wants to come and uh, take the limelight. So I was told that, you know, now the Indian government will step in, you are not needed. I said, what is this, you are not needed? I worked so hard and this is our agreement, I I'm part of this. So they tried to throw me out, put the Indian heavy-handed, some government wallas to take over because they're big shots, you know, and I'm nobody. But I pushed my uh, position. I said, nothing doing. 
So a compromise was reached and there were three of us. There was the HRD guy, there was me and there was a crown princess and we three of us running the show. And uh, then the Indian uh, embassy <laughs> threw a reception in the evening for all the scholars. So I was there talking to the uh, first secretary and you know the people in the, from the Indian embassy. So I was saying, what is your strategy? What is the Indian government's Ministry of Foreign Affairs strategy in these ASEAN countries, which are all Indian civilization based? What is your strategy for using our common heritage, our Sanskriti, uh, you know, as part of a diplomacy for, for building good relations? They couldn't make sense of my question. So they would say, but sir, we are secular. Now, what a joke. I mean, it's like if you go to the French and say, we'd like to learn French. We would like you to create, we are creating a whole uh, university to study French and we're having a world conference on French. They would love to come and send their people and uh, encourage it. If you told the Chinese, we want to start an institute for Mandarin studies and Mandarin civilization, would you help us? They'd love to come. It, it's a very strange thing that uh, the, the promotion and participation in some world event that promotes our Sanskriti is considered uh, an insult or a contrary to uh, secularism. It's a very strange uh, negative idea, a very uh, bad kind of an idea. And I find this to be pervasive. I find this attitude to be pervasive, that <coughs> de denial of your culture, your heritage, your origins, your background is considered cool and it is equated with somehow secularism and asserting that is considered the opposite of secularism. It's a binary, so you're called communalist. And so to prevent being called communalist, therefore you have to jump on the secular bandwagon, therefore you have to deny your heritage. And, la and ladies and gentlemen, let me tell you, we are losing this heritage and the very same heritage is being appropriated into Western culture, Western medicine, Western neuroscience, Western linguistics, Western popular culture very, very fast. And it will be re-exported back to you and then you'll be paying 10 times as much buying something, dilute, a diluted version of what you have lost, you know, of your own culture. And this is, this I'm calling digestion, meaning our civilization is being digested by another civilization. And when, you, when a tiger eats a deer and digests, then the deer is finished, only the tiger is left. And what did not get digested, what the tiger did not want, is excreted as waste. So that is where the digested entity ends up. Civilizations have been digested in the past. Uh, you know, the Greek digested the, some Egyptian civilization, the Europeans, Christians digested the pagan civilization, finished them off, took a lot of their symbols like the Christmas tree, like Easter, but the pagans were gone. Uh, European settlers in America digested a lot, lot from the Native Americans, but the Native Americans were put in museums. Digested civilizations end up in a museum. This is what happens. So today, Tibet is being digested into China. That's what's happening. In another generation of two, or if the Chinese have it their way, the Tibetans will be like a big museum for tourism. So you'll take tourists there and show this is how it was, and with Chinese guides telling you what it means and how this old stuff, primitive stuff, and now we are modern and all that. So uh, Indian youth, I'm told and I'm happy to know, are very proud, very strong, very assertive, but how much do they really know about their, their real roots? I mean, are they proud and assertive because we have BMWs and we have iPads and we have uh, laptops? Are they assertive because we have Bollywood and cricket? And of course, nowadays, cricket not doing that well, but generally proud of that. Are they, are they more assertive of, is their idea of Indian identity the page three pop culture and the uh, kind of a hedonistic lifestyle? Which, which allows them to say we are as Western as Westerners, maybe we are going to be more Western than Westerners? Or are they really also proud based on their classical traditions and their, their grand narrative of the nation? Uh, this, is, this is the question I'll leave you with. Uh, thank you very much and I'll be happy to take uh, questions from you. Thank you.